We're going now next to our climate leaders conversation and I am really pleased to continue Esther's conversation further with uh, two fantastic guests uh, who are going to bring perspectives from the policy world and from the perspective of industry itself. Hans-Jürgen Slamhofer and is uh, joining us. He is from the Federal Ministry for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology from the Republic of Austria. Hans is responsible for working on strategies and measures to tackle the climate crisis, reduce uh, emissions from the transport sector. And of course, Carlos Rodriguez is Managing Director at Renault Trucks uh, for the UK and Ireland. He is focusing the brand's, uh, uh, the brand's efforts, I should say, in electromobility journey with a full uh, electric range of Renault vehicles that are hitting the roads. He's also pretty clear in his uh, opinion that decarbonization of the road industry uh, to make it sustainable is the only way to actually achieve those reductions in emissions. So gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, joining me. I know when we, uh, when we kind of set this conversation up, I wanted to kind of focus first on the question of conversations. Um, and there were, uh, there were some question marks here about policies and whether there was enough conversation happening um, clearly between industry and other stakeholders along with governments. Carlos, I want to open with you. From your perspective, what is the ideal national policy that is required with the example of Austria, that can address every stakeholder's need? Well, I think the first thing to say is that when it comes to policy, we need consistency in these policies. So, because when you are an operator and you are there to renew 100, 200, 300 vehicles fleet, it's a huge investment. Uh, and when you are at that point of making the decision, you need consistency in these policies because then you can plan your, uh, ahead. And, and make for the next four to five years your renewal plans for fleets. So first thing, I think policies should be more than uh, uh, medium term uh, time horizons, three, four, five years. And what we see today is very often a one year, a two year policy. We are starting a bit, but we are unsure. So we need much more bolder policies across all countries in Europe, I would say. Uh, and I think we need the policies as well to be uh, targeted to what the technology is available today. Today, battery electric vehicles are there. Infrastructure for battery, vehicle, battery electric vehicles is there. So what we need is policies which support, I mean, customers that you are just before in the panel, IKEA, Unilever, and so many others, which are the early adopters and will help to get that global scale. And, and that scale will help then reduce even more the cost of the solutions we can bring to the market. And the good news is uh, solutions are ready today in the market. Battery electric vehicles can help decarbonize today uh, um, cities and urban applications. Um, Hans, when you look at it from a government perspective, there are a lot of stakeholders that you have to deal with, pacify, ensure that the economy keeps running. Uh, Carlos makes a point. There are technologies out there. Our panel before also said they're ready to invest in technologies that are there now and then work towards the ideal solution. From a government perspective, what ends up holding you back from having those movements towards a national policy that makes sense for the technology we have today? Yeah, we are, we are on the way. Um, we are not really, um, nobody holds us really back. Um, we have just a situation that um, the, the, technolo the technological side, the developments are very dynamic, uh, and we must make make sure that uh, investments made are are not sunken investments. We we need to um, find ways to to identify no regret investments. And um, um, from from when you look at, at this year only, um, I think the picture gets clearer and clearer. Just as Carlos mentioned, um, the, the battery electric um, truck will be the first on the market. It's already there. Um, so um, our our um, target is really to um, to to make the first steps there. Um, I totally agree that it needs this planning certainty for businesses. I just um, heard from the other session the, the nice. So saying businesses respond to business cases. I think 
um, uh, the public um, side has a role there to set the, the right framework. Um, we have to set up investment schemes targeted to those um, those vehicles, targeted to, to those infrastructure. And um, um, I think that's that's necessary now. We we uh, we will um, focus on zero emission first, on electrifying first, and then see what other technologies are there um, to come and to follow. So when you look at national policy right now, and I'm just sticking with the example of Austria at this point, I'm not even expanding out into the EU. It feels like uh, you, it's industry and policy making a world. Uh, uh, is everyone just talking over each other? Because Carlos is saying the technology is here now, we're investing in it as a business. But then you're kind of saying, we don't want to have sunken costs in, in investing in technology that's there now. We need to be care careful about where we invest. It brings back my question of, are we talking over each other without talking together? Um, personally, I think um, in the last couple of months, we, we, we see things clearer now. And, um, um, and we see that the CO2 fleet emission standards on EU level, um, they are, you know, um, become um, strange and sort of in 2025, but we see now that certain things develop towards um, towards a zero emission um, pathway also for OEMs in the truck segment. Um, and when we see that next year, Austria at least will push for uh, even more ambitious targets in, in that sense. And I think this is one of the uh, legal measures which really make a difference. We have seen that in the passenger car segment that um, that this is the, the, the measure which, which really makes a difference and, and OEMs did make a choice there uh, very clearly towards battery electric vehicles um, and I personally think that a similar choice will be made from OEMs also for the truck segment uh, but still there is a, a role to play also on the national side in sort of in, in terms of setting up this invest uh, incentive scheme so that businesses are really, you know, buying those trucks and that they can um, can uh, have a reliable, publicly available infrastructure. Um, so, yeah, I think we are we are coming closer to, to that point where uh, we can really make those big investments. Carlos, I think the question here for uh, from a business perspective would be, can you kind of lay out the groundwork of where you are right now with your electric trucks. Uh, we're talking yeah. about last mile being one of the one of the uh, focus areas across the across the board, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in China, whether it's in the US. Long haul has always been a bit of that um, game changing moment where governments suddenly will wake up saying, oh, my God, we need to have those charging points across the uh, you know, across the board. Where are you right now in terms of the technology? Uh, is it still a focus on last mile or is it, uh, is it trucks that can go long haul at this point? Just to kind of lay it clear for the government uh, folks who yeah. are watching. So absolutely. So the first thing to say that when we look at that, we have a combination of three things. We need first the vehicle technology, the infrastructure, and then the cost to be right, you know, back to one of the Angel Angela's point, I think was business respond to business cases. So if we look at different applications, right? So in the urban and city environment, do we have the vehicle technology? The answer is clear, yes. Battery electric vehicles from 3.1 ton to 26 tons, which we have now in the market, we are selling today across Europe, are responding to the needs of uh, the operators. When it comes to the infrastructure within urban and city environments, what, what, what we need to understand is the, the most of the battery vehicles we have today will do the job with a one charge and will require overnight charging. So the challenge is around, do customers have at their depots, it was a point from the panel, do customers have at their depot the right infrastructure, the right electric supply? And for that, we have partners we can work with. So the question there is, putting infrastructure at the depots. So there what we need from a cost perspective on urban and city is policy to support infrastructure investment by customers, to support uh, these early adopters to take these vehicles first. So that's urban city environment. Now we flip to your point, Maitri, about more demanding applications, long haul construction sector. 
The technology will be with us in, I would say, from 2025 onwards, which is where we will have the first fuel cell vehicles coming to the market. And there, back to what I said at the start, there is no time to waste. The solution for these applications is fuel cell hydrogen vehicles. So we have no time to waste. Let's invest in the infrastructure because there we will need infrastructure across the main roads so then customers can refuel their vehicles and, and that's the direction of travel. So it's a really a call for action. Uh, don't wait. You know, I use very often that example. When smartphones came to the market, the first smartphones which came to the market were really good. And we didn't wait for smartphone 10 to start the journey. We started with the first one. The vehicles we have today, battery electric vehicles, are great. They do the job. That's the key message. So let's, let's not wait and, and let's move forward. Hans, you're in the unenviable position of knowing that Carlos is making sense, but then having to translate that for policymakers internally within, uh, within governments. Um, how often do you manage to speak with your counterparts on an EU level to understand the targets that have been set, missed, and again, auditors uh, in, the, uh, in the European Union saying, again, the, the, the targets are just so disparate and fragmented across Europe. How often are you able to talk to contemporaries across Europe saying we need a bit of cohesion, some unison to kind of meet the targets that have been set at an EU level, not just at a country or a city level? Yeah, in terms of CO2 targets in the, in the transport sector, we know that um, at least all Western European countries have a problem to meet their targets um, and they are not even, let's say, very close to towards them. Um, um, we see that the Green Deal with, will set the ambition level even higher. Germany is, is setting the ambition level higher uh, right now also for the, for the transport um, sector. They, they are now, I think, debating today a, uh, a even more ambitious CO2 target for 2030. Um, and, and all the countries are facing the same, um, the same challenges. Um, if you look at the technologies, um, in, at the end of the day, the choice is not very big. Um, we, if, you, if you like to have more gas, fossil gas in the system, you, you'll see very, very soon that um, the, the CO2 benefit is not big enough um, in order to really make a difference. Um, hydrogen is not yet there. Um, E-fuels, synthetic fuels are far from anything, uh, far from near and, and, and the, the, the amounts of, of, are not there in the next 10 to 15 years and it's super, super expensive. Um, so it's really battery electric, um, and um, and I think the the, the push needs but Hans, to. But I mean, that's my down. Hans. That's my yeah. Hans. That's my point, right? In terms of the auditors themselves at the European level saying the targets that have been set at a European level are not being met. I'm just going to read out one of the one of the targets that they've talked about. They're saying that if you're even able to reach the targets that have been set at a European level. Uh, 150,000 new, and I'm just talking electric vehicles here, or electric charging points, are saying 150,000 new points are going to be needed, or, or that's almost 3,000 a week to close the gap between the targets set and what's being done right now. And that's just in situations of cars. When you talk about uh, trucks, for example, the numbers are even bigger. They're talking about the fact that you need 11,000 charging points for electric trucks if you want them to even try to do long haul. Uh, you're, to you're talking about 300, uh, 300 hydrogen refueling stations to be installed by 2025. Uh, I mean, these are big numbers where even the auditors themselves off, uh, off government are saying you're setting targets, but you're not really following them up, which is why I was asking in terms of industry telling you, giving you the signal that's happened, but internally within policy making circles, uh, is there coordination, is there conversations happening of why these targets are not being met or why you're not rushing to meet those targets? Yeah, um, I think the, the one of the reasons why are they not met yet is because the, the right policies are not in place. And um, we, we've seen that on the EU level with the Smart and Sustainable Mobility Strategy, the Commission will propose 82 um, new or revised legislative dossiers 
in the upcoming um, year um, in order to translate those high-level Green Deal uh, goals into very concrete measures. And, and that's what, what's needed. Um, we, we cannot meet our um, climate goals without more ambitious CO2 fleet emission standards. That's not possible. Um, so that's why we have to um, we have to put more ambition in there. Um, but at the end of the day, that's the best shot we have, right? All the other technologies are not not there. Um, we can, of course, uh, talk about avoidance and and you know local uh, local and and, and uh, businesses and 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 reducing uh, the, the the length of of um, freight transport we actually need and, and all that. Um, and, and we do that actually, but um, um, at the end of the day, we have that this technology and we need to, you know, uh, be like move faster. So, yeah. Carlos, yeah, I think I the question uh, it's been raised quite significantly over and over again about this fragmentation in terms of just the European market per se. Let's, let's stay with that, right? If you, if you look at what companies like you, yours are doing, is this going to be a situation a bit like the tech industry where you're just going to have to be the first mover, you're going to have to lead the way and then the regulations and the rules end up following? Are you going to just have to go out there and uh, work with partners to install what you need to get the business going? Well, we, we are actually starting that today. I mean, what, what, when it comes to urban environments and applications, for instance, we're already partnering with infrastructure providers with us to go and provide our, our customers a full, uh, uh, a full stop solution, a one stop solution where we actually put the infrastructure, look at the supply, bring the vehicle in. So that's what we're already doing. But I think when we move to a more like long goal demanding, these are other challenges there. And, and, uh, and, and I think there, there would be, uh, I mean, little progress if we don't have the infrastructure. You know, what's the most, what is the most important thing for operators? Uptime, so they need reliable technology and they need flexibility. And what the fuel cell and hydrogen will bring is that flexibility for operators to be able to quickly refill. This is one of the things we need to do. And, and, and with, this is, with the new technology, we cannot get away from uptime and flexible work for operators. So where we are now, we are starting the journey. We are the vehicles. Let's let's move on. I think, and we can we can of course say, maybe we will have something better later. Maybe that technology is not great, but I can I can tell you that use uh, biofuels today, HVO for instance. All vehicles are good. Customers can do that today without any investment. It's just a small, more expensive fuel. But if you are really serious about decarbonizing your uh, 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 your um, or reducing your emissions, you can do it now. You can move to battery electric vehicles now for your urban applications and the rest will come later. So it's about let's start the journey. Let's start working together on that. So we have both of you here just to add, I mean, considering that you are talking to each other, when you listen to each other's points, I think you get each other. But what would you say to each other at this point to say, OK, if there's a lack of clarity and this is what we need, this is what we need. Can, can you make, can you clearly give us ideas of, to each other and to the government officials watching, other manufacturers watching, um, to kind of say, this is what we need, have a clear conversation and lay out your ideal situation? Well, well if I start, I mean, the, the truth is, those conversations happen uh, in different countries. You know, uh, if I speak from what happened, I know the brand on the trucks over Europe, in many countries do that. We do that in the UK and Ireland. We are in close uh, contact with the uh, public authorities and the, those uh, influencers. Um, I think it's about uh, the fear of not going in the right direction. Well, I think the good news is I think there is today consensus around battery electric vehicles and fuel cells and clean hydrogen are the solution. So I think there is no more time to waste. It's just now moving to it. Uh, and. Uh, the, the best proof that we can give to go to the policy makers is that if I look at Renault Trust, we have doubled our already uh, R&D investment in battery electric vehicles from uh, 2022, uh, the next two years. Why is that? It's because we strongly believe this is the right direction. This is, this is strategic for us, but it's also strategic from 
uh, let's say, climate perspective, there is that's the direction of travel. And we believe in that, and we think that's the right solution, which will deliver both carbon reduction, uh, uh, satisfaction to our uh, customers, operators, flexibility. So I think, I think this is just about now getting that crystallization at that moment of truth where we, we move ahead. Hans, what would you uh, say to the OEMs that turn up, uh, other stakeholders, when you are talking to them to make your position quite clear? What do you need to say? What do you need clarity on? Yeah, what, what we find very helpful is this what happened to car segment in the last couple of months that OEMs clearly uh, announced their zero emission targets and their sales targets. Um, we, we, we see uh, like all the or most of the big OEMs um, saying we, we will uh, get out of ICE sales in 2030, 2035. Um, and and this is really helpful because with with that information we can even actually calculate the necessary infrastructure. Um, we we will of, or we have of course national targets as well. But with that you know back up from OEMs we see that actually possible because those vehicles will be manufactured. Uh, the the, the uh, capacity is there, and we have we haven't heard the same. Um, announcement from the truck side i do understand that to a certain extent because you know we have uh, 10 years more uh, longer regulations in place in terms of co2 fleet emission standards but i think that we don't have the time we had for the passenger car segment i think it has to go faster um, in terms of trucks and we need that um, clarity sooner well i think just to, to answer to to answer just point we have actually sorry Maitri, sorry to interrupt here but to Anne's point, and no, please go ahead. you just said, what, what's, what's, the, what's the commitment from a truck perspective? Well, the good news is that we have actually done our commitment. We have talked about it and maybe not enough. So I think it's a great, great uh, participation to that. But by 2030, we will have all applications with uh, carbon-free solutions. And by 2040, in a global scale, the Volvo Group Animal Trucks, we want to be selling uh, uh, all of those because 10 years later, because it takes 10 years to renew a full fleet of trucks, you know, all, the, uh, all trucks uh, around. So by 2040, this is what will be uh, in a global scale selling all these trucks, carbon free. 10 years later, by 2050, we will have a full fleet, fleet of trucks operating. So we'll be in line with the Green Deal and the 1.5 tar uh, degrees target, science based target. So actually, we have done our homework uh, from a truck perspective as well as like the cars. So by 2030, we are able and capable, be capable of providing carbon-free solutions for all truck applications. But what I would like to say today, we already have applications for probably 40 to 50 percent of all applications in the road. So let's not wait. That's what, that's my point. Let's not wait. We have at least for a fair big share of the urban and safety applications the technology available today. So, Carlos, that brings up a point from that was raised in the previous panel. Hans has raised, raised it as well. That sometimes you need that push from the from the consumer, the end consumer themselves. Um, at at some point, how, how do you change consumer behavior um, as an OEM? How do you influence the end consumer to then let governments know uh, from their their own voting bank and their taxpayers that this is the direction to head in because it sounds like governments need that little bit of a, a push from uh, from the end consumer how do you do change hearts and minds well you know we for now a year we've been talking to a lot of customers and and i think what we we do the traditional way of doing business in the truck industry we talk to transport companies and, and, and they operate through contractor companies with their end customers, you know, like the, the likes like IKEA or all supermarkets. What we find is when the end user, such as IKEA, sets the scene and tells, now it's time, by 2025, I only want electric vehicles. This is the kind of things we need because this then puts everyone under pressure to deliver. And, and, and if that's the statement from the end users, uh, I think then with a, a bit of support from the policy uh, to make electric vehicles the, the, the viable solution compared to more traditional internal combustion engines, 
it will happen. So, so it's really a mindset about let's get on with it. And, uh, you know, I, I go back to my smartphone example. They are definitely much more expensive than the mobile phones you had before. But there is a lot of benefits to that. You know, electric vehicles, it's not only a cost increase, it's cleaner air, it's less noise, it's a much better environment. All of that will contribute to the better uh, 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 society and living. So I think, I think it's, so, it's all positive. It's all positive from the side of the development, um, Hans. So from your perspective, when you are looking at all the options available in front of you, uh, in your mind, how do you see the move towards electric trucks versus a move towards possibly rail freight as being cleaner or the many other options out there? How are you balancing it? How do you view it? Yeah, from an Austrian perspective, the, the modal shift to rail freight is, is was always, always very important and, and still is and will be in the future. We see that uh, even though the road freight um, segment is decarbonized, there's still, still, still an energy efficiency advantage if you transport goods on, on rail. Um, so we, we will um, um, target a, a, an ambitious modal shift share of 40% still, uh, always in the future. Uh, also in the future, we, we now have this 40% share target in place and we'll uh, try to follow it in the future. I think this is um, this is sort of the, the backbone of what we are doing, but um, you know, we had this discussion here in Austria, also in our ministry, why why should you know we we have an, um, an com a competition with an attractive road, decarbonized road transport uh, with regards to our clean um, rails. But we, we see that um, we need both, actually, we need both clean, we need both competitive. And we, of course, will, would like to see, a, a, again, a certain shift towards rail, even though the road freight uh, is decarbonized in the future. Um, and, and this is why, you know, all those in incentives now we, which we put in place for road freight, for zero emission road freight, will be temporary only. Um, so we need those for a certain amount of time. And in the future, of course, uh, we, we will have, um, you know, all those road charges, of course, in place again, also for the electric trucks, in order to have a, a, a level playing field between those two um, um, to still uh, between road and rail, yeah. Hans, what, here's a curiosity question. Why is there such reticence to jump right in and help lead, um, lead this, uh, this, this decarbonization effort uh, when everyone seems to be quite gung-ho in terms of investing in it? Um, at the end of the day, these are businesses that are taking massive risks, investing massively in research and development. Why is there a reticence from a government perspective in also doing the same, jumping in feet first, because that's the only way to meet targets? Yeah, I think we are we are coming closer to this point. As I said, um, I think there is, of course, there are certain players who are in the fossil fuel business um, who are not um, convinced of going to zero emission right now. Um, some of them try to see the, the way uh, with, with CNG or LNG is a bridging technology towards um, uh, e-fuels in transport. Um, we we don't we don't see that really. We we see that this is would be a high risk choice to to go into importing um, uh, e-fuels from you know abroad uh, without knowing what the price is, where where they're coming from, and all that. Um, and it doesn't relate to the to the to the timing of necessary CO2 emission reductions we need in the next five to 10 years. So um, of course, they are, they are, um, um, not every, everyone is convinced going towards zero emission, but I think there are now, right now in uh, May 2021, there are enough, uh, more than enough companies, entrepreneurs, um, um, companies in logistics who are willing to move forward and to go towards zero emission directly. Um, um, so I think um, we, are, we, are, we are ready 
at least from our our point of view, um, and we will move now to zero emission. Carlos, so finally, uh, 30 seconds. Hans needs to get excited about your uh, all the innovations that are happening. So 30 seconds, tell us what we can expect from Renault trucks, what's in the pipeline, and how excited should we be about electric trucks going forward in the next couple of years? Oh, we should be absolutely excited. We have uh, uh, a lot of news coming. We are already uh, from, as I said, 3.20 to 26 tons vehicles available. We will introduce uh, later this year another vehicle, uh, which we will talk soon. We have extended range of batteries coming, uh, and I think we have also construction vehicles coming 2023 and long haul vehicles as well at that point and tractor. So really, we are ahead of the game. And I think what we do with our customers, the, all of these customers who have their net zero uh, targets, what we do is we build with them what we call an energy transition plan because we are convinced about the technology, because we know when those are going to be introduced, we are capable now of doing an energy transition plan with them. So we start small, we take these applications already into uh, carbon-free solutions, and when the time comes, we will swap these vehicles. These are the kind of things and innovative ideas we have. And I, I just say to all uh, forthcoming and early adopters, come and talk to us. We have a lot to, to do together to decarbonize road freight. Carlos, Hans, thank you so much for bringing both your perspectives to the table. It's always important to keep those conversations open and the dialogues going to ensure that we keep the momentum going towards uh, the goals we've all set for ourselves. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much for joining me today.